Harry's back and so are we. Welcome to Leavesden Studios. Who would have thought that this drafty old aircraft factory just a few miles up the M1 from London would, for the last 10 years, have played host to the most successful film series of all time. We're going to go inside and have a snoop. It might not look much from the outside, but believe me, it's inside where all the magic happens. Come behind the scenes of the seventh film in the Harry Potter series. Now, as you know, there are seven books, so you may be thinking this is the last film. But luckily for us, you're wrong, because it was too big a story to squeeze into just one film. So, in fact, this is the first of the last. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, part one. This film is unique because for the first time ever, it all happens away from Hogwarts. Life has changed beyond all imagining. Nothing is as it seems. And by the end of this film, no one is safe and the death toll will be rising. We'll be getting the inside track on the making of this film and picking up some very exclusive snippets. It is the only moment between Harry and Hermione where you go, are they about to, to, to do something? Finding out what happened when Harry Potter closed down Piccadilly Circus. And for the first time ever, we get to see how they fly a broomstick, and I get to have a go. To be honest, you're not going to get any closer to the stars of the film than this. Oh, <gasps> Ben! But make no mistake, this is the most dangerous chapter in the Harry Potter story yet. Our heroes find themselves away from everything that is safe and familiar, struggling to find their way without the guidance of Hogwarts headmaster, Albus Dumbledore who died at the end of the last film, leaving Harry in turmoil without his friend and mentor. Not only is there the emotional side to Dumbledore's death which affects Harry, but there's also the kind of the purely practical side that he was the guy who with all the information. And now that he's died, sort of all of that knowledge has, we think, has died with him. The film sees Harry, with the help of his friends, continue Dumbledore's mission as best he can to destroy Voldemort, the most evil wizard of all time. Help me! Voldemort split his soul into seven different pieces and he hid the pieces of his soul into these different objects which have kind of like, which have personal meaning to him. And um, so the only way to essentially defeat Voldemort is to destroy each and every one of these Horcruxes. The question is, did he actually destroy the real Horcrux? First of all, can you explain why you decided to split the book into two parts? Well, when the idea was first mooted, I thought it was a terrible idea. I mean, we've never done it before. We, we discussed doing it on the fourth book, mm. uh, on Goblet of Fire, because that was the first one that was massive. As the books got larger, we made a decision to tell the story from Harry's point of view. Mm. And that meant necessarily that certain things fell by the wayside. In this one, uh, in the seventh book, in Deadly Hallows, everything is really about Harry. And if we were to leave anything out, it would really hurt the story. It wouldn't make sense, really. Mm. And if we weren't going to have a five-hour five film, <laughs> we needed to split it up into two. At the start of this film, Harry's preparing to leave Privet Drive, the home of his measly muggle family, the Dursleys, who took him in when he was orphaned as a baby. But in order to get away without being caught by Voldemort and his followers, his friends have come up with a very clever plan to confuse them. It involves drinking this Polyjuice potion. It's very strong, though. Forget seeing double. There's seven Harrys in this film. Oh! That's coming over me. Oh! The plan is that each of his friends will turn into a Harry clone and take a different route back to a safe house. We'll go in pairs. That way, if anyone's out there waiting for us, and I reckon there will be, they won't know which Harry Potter is the real one. The real one? I believe you're familiar with this particular brew. No. Absolutely not. I told you you'd take it well. Every film, we have a moment kind of early on which remind and it, it's sort of where Harry is reminded but to all intents and purposes the audience are being reminded of the magic and how kind of cool it is and in this one that's kind of that moment of just going the, seeing the amazing things magic can do show wrote it in the book and, and you know you read that and you go that's a great scene 
And then, there, as you say, there comes the, the challenge of making it real. Uh, you know, Joe, you go, oh, that's a great scene. They went, oh, oh my goodness, we have to figure out how to do it. So how did they do it? We shot with Dan for like two days all on his own, but we'd have the actors he was playing alongside us. So Dan would watch Fleur take off her top and talk to Bill, and he'd study that very, very carefully. And then we'd talk together about how she would do that, and she would explain to Dan why she moved in a certain way, and Dan would listen, and then Dan would have a go. We then had body doubles for every different Harry. So when we see them getting the clothes out of the bag, you'll have body doubles putting arms in to take, take out bits of clothing. I mean, it took a long, long time. As for Harry, yes. yes. The real Harry. Where the devil are you, anyway? Here. I think for Dan, it was kind of quite, quite weird, because he had to kind of play everyone else, and he had to kind of, kind of watch us all kind of walk and kind of all our body language and that, and kind of try and mimic it. And it's funny what you notice about people when you look closely, even when you know them really well. Wow, well, we're, we're identical. identical. Rupert walks with a really, really sort of sexy wiggle in his really? hips. He really swings his hips. Well, just suddenly, like, obviously, Rupert's a good, good-looking guy anyway. But I thought I bet that's something to do while other girls like him because he just walks with this kind of. He's got a wiggle. He struts. It's really, <laughs> really cool. Well, you're looking at it, thinking, actually, that that reminds me of someone I know. It's <laughs> yeah. me. Well, yeah, because he kind of found out like, I do this weird kind of hip wiggle thing when I when I walk. You do a hip wiggle thing? Apparently, yeah. I've never really been aware of it, but... Have you noticed it since? I'm quite conscious of it now, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For the actual process of morphing one character into another, the visual effects team used an unusual technique. When we kind of morph into Harry, it kind of affects us quite badly and we're doing these weird kind of face things. So they use this special, like, I think it was like a thousand cameras kind of at once. No way! Like, filming different parts of our phone. We had to wear this, like, glow-in-the-dark face paint as well. It was... How cool. I didn't quite understand why we had to wear the face paint, but... <laughs> it was they were just having a laugh. They were just sitting there going, yeah, more face paint. Yeah. They'll never ask why. My husband, the Joker. This scene sees the first ever appearance of Bill Weasley, played by Donald Gleeson, son of Brendan, who fans will know as Mad-Eye Moody. We've got to get the hell out of here! Well, I'd really good fun. I've got a funny little bit of business in there that'll be, only be in the background, but that I, re that I really enjoy doing, so I think... What, what should we be looking out for? What's the business? Uh, I have to help Dan... Well, kind of help Dan Radcliffe with his bra. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so, let me tell you, Dan had trouble opening a bra. Uh, no, hang on, cut that. Clemence's uh, fleur in, in the film is changing into Harry, so she changes in and she's trying to take off clothes and she got them. Dan, seeing Dan in a bra was pretty hilarious. So he puts on her clothes and has to then get them off, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being, he's being he's trying to unhook the bra at the back. <laughs> and we had to cut a couple of times because he was having trouble. <laughs> but that was only because it was on him. Yes. If, it had been the, if he'd been taking it off... Fine. ..me Seconds. or a girl, I'm yeah. sure it would have been fine. <laughs> if they used the take I like, it's a one-handed job. I knew she was lying about that tattoo. Harry, your eyesight really is awful. Dan plays women really well, actually. He sort of enjoyed that bit. He played Emma really well, and he played Fleur really well. I was actually quite pleased, and this is only going to add fuel to the fires, the rumour that I'm gay. I don't really care. I'm so past the point of caring, I really don't. But I, I looked fantastic <laughs> in Fleur's outfit, right? I <laughs> thought I looked really good. What on earth were you right. having to wear? It was these sort of... <laughs> Skin tight trousers. Right, okay. Um, with sort of jeans. With. Um, uh, it was a, quite a, a clingy, clingy top, top. And then a nice little blue sort of crop jacket on top. Really nice, man. Different button configuration. Really cool. I was really pleased. The detailing yeah. kind of worked. I bet it really brought your eyes out. It did, Ben. It did, it did. <laughs> Absolutely, it did. <laughs> The Seven Harrys was complicated enough, but then we had the chase, which, which was a, a really complex sequence. David really wanted to develop a, a real, you know, chase that involved not only an aerial battle when the um, Death Eaters turned up, but also he wanted to have his sort of road chase as well. So we use a technique called previs. We do an animation, basically, of, of what we think the whole story is going to be about. We spent about six months, actually, in previsualization um, designing that sequence. So that's six months preparation before any filming took place, and then this amazing sequence was shot in seven locations, making it one of the most complex in Harry Potter history. How do you know you're getting all the right bits and pieces and, and, and you've got the shots that you need? It's a long process. The, the opening chase, there will be something significantly shot from that sequence from April 2009 and we'll finish shooting it in April 2010. Every month, 
there is something to do with that sequence. So it takes a year just to put together that, that, that short, very dramatic and important, but that sequence. Which will be under two minutes long. Fourteen months they've been filming, and it all ends right here, all that time, all that effort, in a muddy bog in the reeds by the Weasley's house. <laughs> Everybody loves a good wedding, even wizards. And finally, in this film, we get to have one here in the grounds of the Burrows, which is the Weasley's family seat. The big question is, which of the Weasleys is it getting hitched? It's not Ron, is it? What can you tell us about the wedding? Yeah, that's quite exciting. It was quite cool to have kind of all the family, all the family back and uh, all getting dressed up. And, and to meet your brother Bill? <laughs> yes, yeah. It's kind of about time, yeah. Don't worry, girls. Ron's still on the market. It's actually the wedding of his older brother Bill. Hello, Harry. Bill Weasley. Oh, pleasure to meet you. We meet our uh, son, Bill, at Donal Place. This, this episode, it was like, who are you? <laughs> We're your, I'm your son. <laughs> oh, yes, that's it. You've been in the way, you've been. I'm a good looking, dashing track. chat with great taste in women. Yeah. And what was the, what, what was the Brendan, like? He's Brendan's son, of course, so it's, it, it's becoming a family <laughs> firm now. <laughs> Did you feel like mother of the groom? Was it sort of an emotional occasion for you? It was, my boy, yes. No, I loved it. It was just great fun. Not I that you'd met your boy before, of course. No, he, no, was he, was he was new. He was new. yes. <laughs> I hadn't met him before. But I love the scenes with, every, with great crowds of us together because they're good fun. There was a lot of standing around <laughs> and kind of greeting people. That was kind of what we were doing for a Which is, wedding. let's face it, exactly like a real wedding. I I've mean, never been to a wedding. It was my first wedding. My you, first wedding. Well, hold on. You've never been to a wedding? Never been to a wedding. I assumed you'd say you'd never been married, but you didn't... How old are you now? I'm 26. I've got friends. But they've just never invited you? If that's what... What? What? Well, how, no what one. What do you mean never invite? They haven't got married. Oh, how okay. old are you? I'm 35. <laughs> but I was going to say, but I would assume by the time you're 26, you'd have been to a wedding. No one you know no. has ever got married? No. No, well, no I've, family I've had members? I've been working. I'm busy. <laughs> I had to dance with Daddy Weasley. Oh. The two of us. Yeah, it was really lovely. Everybody Pretty dress. Up. Yeah. How gorgeous. was the dress? Gorgeous, very floaty. Lovely. Gorgeous. Just slid over my padding. Lovely. <laughs> you go and Ben, you can touch them because they're not real. <gasps> ben! Actually, you touched a bit of the real. Did I? <laughs> I Never felt did. one like that. No, no. Just... <laughs> oh, Mrs Weasley's. They're Mrs Weasley. They're Mrs Weasley. Yes. Actually, it's an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I think you need to feed the guinea pig. I will, I'm going to feed it. Please explain that they aren't real. They're not real. People writing in. <laughs> I mean, I'm going now. These aren't Mrs Weasley's boots, so can you keep them out of <laughs> shot? <laughs> I'm going now. Thank you, Julie. Goodbye and thank you. <laughs> Do you get a spectacular outfit? Um, well, for Hermione, I get a pretty spectacular outfit. Excellent. You know, um, it's kind of sexy actually. Really? I mean, I mean, I mean, by Hermione standards. Hermione sexy. Yeah, Hermione wow. sexy. It's red, quite low cut. You know, she's an action hero. She's 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 coming into a new role, and she's a young woman now, so she's she's allowed to be a bit sexy. I'm not sure the same can be said for Xenophilius Lovegood, father of Harry's friend Luna, played by Reese Fans, who takes dad dancing at a wedding to a whole new level. But it's actually his daughter who's come up with all the moves. And in case you're wondering, those bruises are makeup. I started looking through the book and they do, well, Luna dances by herself and she's meant to look as if she's batting away Raxworth's Harry sort of things. And, um, so then the next day, uh, yeah, David was like, well, after this, you lead him off and maybe you do a sort of a special dance. And, um, uh, and, and I had been thinking of something in my room. I was like, yeah, and it w was a bit like that. So I showed it to them and, um, and to the choreographer of the steps. And um, they, they really liked it. And so they put Reese doing the same thing. And we sort of turned different ways and changed direction. So it's going to become a, great, a craze. Yeah. The love could two-step. Or whatever it is, the yeah. rat pad. Now, it's not just the bride and groom who get presents at this wedding. The new Minister for Magic, Rufus Scrimmager, who's played by the wonderful Bill Nye, turns up with some very strange presents for Harry, Ron and Hermione. Herein is set forth the last will and testament of Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore. In this film, we have Bill Nye uh, playing Scrimmager. 
who is fantastic. There was, uh, we have kind of eventually reached consensus on how to say his name, and we're going with Scrimmager. I think that's how we've ended up saying it. Because I'm looking at it, and it's, is it spelt Scrimmager? It doesn't it's feel kind like... of spelt Scrimmager. My character is called Rufus Scrimgeour, and I'm surprised I can pronounce it. He is a minister, or rather, let's get serious, the minister of magic, and he's a very, very important person, therefore. And his job in the movie is to deliver Dumbledore's will to Harry and to try and interpret it and interpret what it means and what, uh, what it will mean to Harry and to the future. And Harry won't tell him. He brings a deluminator for Rupert, which can turn light on and off at will. Brilliant. He brings the tales of Beetle the Bard, which are magical children's stories for Emma, and he brings the snitch that's used at Quidditch for young Harry. He tries to get Harry to tell him the, significant, the true significance of these objects, but he, um, I can't really tell you anymore because uh, I have to kill myself. And then, bang, out of nowhere, uh, there's a message from Voldemort, all of the Death Eaters apparate into the wedding and there's just kind of like chaos, kind of like, I think it feels as if the war really has begun now and um, like nowhere safe. They are coming. They are coming. Obviously, Hermione, Harry and Ron have to get out of there. No! No! As Voldemort's presence and dominance is growing, Malfoy Manor becomes the heartbeat of his operations. Home to Harry's nemesis Draco and his once powerful family who have suffered a dramatic fall from grace. This is the first time we've seen Draco's family home. Its stunning Jacobean features were inspired by Hardwick Hall in Derbyshire, which was once described as one of the most splendid houses in England. And who would guess that much of this panelling and detail was actually made from foam? But all of this grandeur counts for nothing if you've fallen out of favour with the Dark Lord. What about you, Lucius? My lord. I start off so full of hope, Lucius. You know, Voldemort has chosen my house to be his headquarters, and, and uh, it's just having the king in your own house is mm. a ringing endorsement. I require your wand. Within about two seconds, it all turns completely pear-shaped when he takes my wand off me. You don't take a wand off a wizard in public. Uh, it's just not appropriate. And then he snaps it, and I think he's going to kill me, and, and it all just turns into my worst nightmare and goes downhill from there. And that's, that, that very public fall from grace is, is horrific for the Malfoys and for It's for emasculating Lucifer. for me, and it's, what it is uh, is the moment where it becomes clear to me that he does not see a place for me in the future, in this new world that he's going to create if he wins. Let's talk about Voldemort and what his plans are. What's he been up to and what's he trying to get out He's of? up to his old tricks again, Ben. I hate to say it, but he, 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 hasn't, he hasn't turned around. He's still uh, pursuing the art of darkness. Well, much the same, obviously. He's uh, obsessed with getting rid of the young, the young wizard, Harry. As inspiring as I find your bloodlust, Bellatrix, I must be the one to kill Harry Potter. It's going to be interesting. There's, there's a few scenes, again, that I don't want to say too much, but... It, it, it has had me close to believing that this is actually a, a real thing. Some of the, some of the, he he murders some people in some very very uh, gruesome ways. Yeah, I don't even want to. I don't even know the right words for it. If I am to kill him, I must do it with another's one. It's a strange time, certainly for myself, because I'm not used to seeing all these things out in the public and. Lots of very undesirables roaming around my house. I don't pick generally the prettiest people to play Death Eaters. No offence to any of them who are out there. <laughs> they are gorgeous in real life, but they make them wear all sorts of teeth. And So, yeah, it's, uh, it's a little daunting, even for Tom the actor, let alone Drake, <laughs> Draco, the, uh, the, the young boy. The first scene he's in is terrifying, which, was, which actually takes place on this set. Yeah. It's really, really scary. I mean, I came down to, to watch a bit of the filming. Um, I left quite quickly because it was taking a long time, but, um, <laughs> but the bit I saw was really scary. Um, yeah, no, it'll be good for people to see what people have been running, what all these characters have been running from for yeah. so many years. I have seen your heart, and it is mine. 
Harry, Ron and Hermione are hiding out here in grim old place. The former HQ to the Order of the Phoenix, once owned by Sirius Black, Harry's godfather, and now belonging to Harry himself. And it's here that they're reunited with Creature, the rather curmudgeonly house elf, who is very upset to find he's now in Harry's service, and as such, is charged with a very important mission. He is tasked with finding the whereabouts of a Horcrux disguised as a locket. This scene also sees the return of the much-loved Dobby. They look so realistic, these house elves, that it's hard to believe they don't actually exist. But at the heart of these state-of-the-art CGI creatures is a very human element. It was very important that, um, that we had actors to play Dobby and Creature. You've been spying on us, have you? We asked them to come along during all of the filming, so when the whole scene was shot, so that um, David could work very closely with them and we could kind of develop the personalities and characteristics of the house elves in each scene, which felt quite important to actually know how the, uh, the other actors are going to interact with them. Even though obviously they're not, not the right size, having them there to actually give a performance was, was really important. So we, we filmed a rehearsal with each of them on on camera, so we had reference of, of where they were. And then we had um, body doubles to play the house elves, basically, so that there were eye lines available on the set. They're not of the correct height or proportions, but small enough to give all of the other actors a sense of, of where they were in space and moving around. We then removed them from the plate and obviously replaced them with the CG creature and CG Dobby. Master Weasley, it's so good to see you again. Wicked trainers. So, Dolores Umbridge has the locket that Harry, Ron and Hermione must steal, which is a bit of a nightmare, really, because she's working at the Ministry of Magic, which, of course, is crawling with Death Eaters. So, they need to find a cheeky way in, because they can't go in the usual routes, and they certainly can't go in as themselves. We take Polyjuice Potion um, to become other people. We become three other people that we don't know really anything about, but we know they work in the Ministry. A little bit of Polyjuice Potion and a sneaky back door is what they need. Fortunately, there's a very convenient entrance in a very unusual place. Do I flush? You may remember that the last time we saw the Ministry of Magic in Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, it was blown to smithereens. For this film, the set was painstakingly rebuilt to exactly the same specification, with one exception. This statue, which reflects the dark times in which this film is set. The design of the statue was influenced by several historical sculptures, particularly from Soviet Russia and pre-war Germany, and shows the oppression of the Muggles, or non-wizarding folk. That's you and me, in other words. There were around 50 of these figures and each took two weeks to handcraft. They were all made by one man. There's three characters who work in the Ministry that we've never seen before necessarily. Yep. Suddenly, you guys are impersonating them. Polyjuice, yes. you become them. Yes. So someone was being you, being themselves. Yes. It is odd because we were sort of then, me, Rupert and Emma have consultancy roles <laughs> behind the monitor. Do you get a proper seat? I think if I get proper seats anyway, you're getting on a day-to-day -day I mean, like, like, a, like a, <laughs> <laughs> I say, Let's take the star seats out of it. Do you get, like, <coughs> consultants to uh, No, unfortunately, we didn't. I'm definitely angling for an extra credit, though. Even if you're in the know, all this polyjuicing stuff is quite tricky to get your head around. So let's take this really slowly. So there's this little character called Mafalda, who's really little secretary, and um, she's the one that um, Hermione gets in. So really, I'm a sort of flamboyant costume. So essentially, right now, you are channeling. I'm channeling. Yeah. Hermione. So it's Hermione being you. No, it's you being Hermione being you. Yeah. It, no, it's me being Mafalda, then being Mafalda's body with Hermione in. It's really straightforward. Yeah, I'm trying not to think about it too much. <laughs> David, you are Dan, you are Harry, you are... I, I can't quite... I'm, I'm getting lost in who's who. You're not the only one. <laughs> I'm playing uh, Albert Runcon, and Dan takes his body over and pretends to be him in order to get into the Ministry of Magic. You're actually impersonating Dan being Harry, but as yourself. Yes. Is that kind of what you're 
breaking it down to the essence. I am impersonating. Could you just say that again? <laughs> You're being Dan, who's Harry, being you. Being Dan, who's Harry, being me. Correct. So is but he... I'm being... So I'm being my character, being Dan, who's playing Harry, who's playing Runcorn, who's, who's, who's playing you. you. Right. Did you get that? No. And, the, and, and in terms of that as a challenge for an actor... <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, it's uh, complicated to explain who I am. I'm actually Ron Weasley, as in I am Ron Weasley, but I, Ron Weasley, for my sequences, looks like this. That's bloody disgusting. We've had Rupert Grint down, sometimes running through the scenes before I do it, and I get to watch him and then watch him on camera as well, see what he does and just, just try and do it like... Well, a bit like Rupert would do it, but also how I interpret Ron as doing it. There's just something about the way he moves. It's quite low. I think that's kind of youth, really. You know, he's quite... Was I, I'm more kind of up here and trying to stand yes, straight yes, yes. Now. And he's got that low centre of gravity and he moves his shoulders kind of quite solidly. And he does a lot of looking up like that. That's fascinating. <laughs> and, 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 and has he engaged with that? Has he kind of said, this is really eerie, I feel like you're doing me far too well? No, he hasn't. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> he looks a bit oddly at me now. He's not, then, he's he's not going, I don't do that. And one mustn't tell lies. I actually prefer myself um, played by this kind of real tough guy. Scottish. Um, so David, David's quite tough and he's Scottish. You're right, he's, he's carrying that off, but he stupefies in a very dramatic way. He stupefies in a much more dramatic way. He sounds like he's saying, Superfly! <laughs> and he says, Stupefy, which, which, which I enjoy. <laughs> Stupefy! Deep in the bowels of the Ministry are a cluster of courtrooms that are playing host to, to a witch hunt, or rather a non-witch hunt, because the Ministry is on a desperate bid to purge society of anyone who isn't pure blood. And what's terrifying about this situation is that evil is now at the heart of everything that was once good. And it is here that Harry, Ron and Hermione find Professor Umbridge wearing the locket that they're seeking. A wand was taken from you upon your arrival at the Ministry today, Mrs Catamull. Is this that wand? A very intense scene happening mm. just there. Can you just explain what was going on? Yes, well, she's, she's back on form, Dolores, in uh, film seven, I think we're on, um, trying um, for Mary Catamull for not being a, for not being a witch. Mm. So um, all those... Um, trials years ago for witches, tri witch yes. trials. This is because you're not a witch, she's on trial. Is it, is, it, is it a loyalty to Voldemort that she has, or is it just authority and power that she loves? I think she loves power, authority and purity. And these people are not pure, and she's still trying to weed out the impure. And that is, the, and that is sort, of, sort of what Voldemort's all about as well, though, isn't it? So yeah. she yeah. is dark like that. Yes, she's sure. She's, she's, yeah, she's dark. While these films are renowned for their spectacular sets, sometimes only the real thing will do. And Harry Potter does nothing by halves. You, you do have to watch the moment where we shut down Piccadilly Circus for the first time in 32 years. Extraordinary as it is to imagine, the Harry Potter team shipped into Piccadilly Circus 500 extras who played the passers-by, 35 cars, 15 black cabs, one limo, five buses, one police car and two rickshaws. They were joined by 500 crew and they did this for two nights running. Unbelievable. They actually closed the whole kind of Piccadilly, Piccadilly Circus. That must have been surreal. It, yeah, I mean, there was no kind of real people. There was all kind of extras and yeah. they kind of filled it with people. There was background action! Many, many years ago, I was a location manager. Someone had said to me, um, OK, we need to film in Piccadilly Circus. I would have said, OK, we better get someone else then, <laughs> uh, because I don't think I would have taken it on. It was a huge, huge uh, undertaking. But they managed to get everyone on the side, all the shopkeepers on the side, the police on the side, the council on the side, uh, and close the streets, and uh, there we were. Not only did they close the streets, they also persuaded the local businesses to leave their lights on for the filming to keep it looking as realistic as possible. It was really clutch, yeah. And they had all these kind of, I don't know, like buses, double-decker buses going through. It was, it was a mad day, yeah, but it was good. The scene shows Harry, Ron and Hermione apparating into central London as their journey continues. First of all, we stop at a cafe and... Um... Everything starts with a latte. Absolutely. <laughs> Go. Leave. Actually, there's a thing in there for um, people like me, spotters of sort of 
insignificant trivia, but um, there's in the cafe scene, you'll have to probably work quite hard to find it, but there is, on the wall, there is an Equus poster. Is there really? Um, yeah, because I knew we were supposed to be filming this part of the scene supposed to take place near Shaftesbury Avenue, yeah. and so I just sort of couldn't like resist. It's a really self-indulgent in joke, in but I just thought, can we... It would just be really funny, but I don't yeah. know really why. As I know, Dan, the, the, often the best parts of any film are the hardest parts to see, yeah. like my part in the last film. 24 frames of magic. Yeah. But the people that know find it. The people that look for it find it. Yeah. Yeah. So where do we go from here? Vicky Cauldron? It, we're sort of just sitting there minding our own business when two guys who look like builders or, or so they're sort of wearing, wearing overalls and stuff walk in and, uh, and they go to the, to the cafe and start. We think they're ordering coffee, but no, wait, a completely ulterior motive becomes very quickly apparent. Help! <laughs> One of the things I love about this film is that uh, the, the three kids, absolutely no kind of training in terms of combat magic, are always better than any adult they <laughs> face. It's better that we just wipe their memories. If we kill them, they'll know we were here. Now, in all the years I've been coming to the Harry Potter sets, I've never been allowed to get on a broomstick, but today I've been invited to G Stage, where they're prepping for another stunt, and I'm going to get to fly. And, and the flying, of course, has become quite a dramatic thing over the years, and it was such a closely guarded secret. Yes. Whereas now, we'll just let you come in and film yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, well, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm going to have a go at some point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, see, now, this is the thing, is that you're going to get on one of our new Quidditch brooms that's oh. been around since the last two years. Right. Which is much nicer. Oh, really? Which, is, which, is, which has a bit more of a sort of tractor seat type affair right. for you to sit on rather than the razor knife yes rather than the bike saddle that it was before i've got blood a has been drawn from unpleasant places we will put it like that really yeah you've, you've... Uh, ages ago it's all healed up now it's fine <laughs> <laughs> that's really only here in the world of harry potter would you find a man who pays his bills by designing magical broomsticks just talk us through sort of where we've been and some of the brooms that we've got here OK, we've kind of got a slight history of, of broom making over the last ten years, and so we could start off here with the Nimbus 2000, which... Um, I love this broom. This was his first? This was Harry's this first? This was the first, yes, yeah. And uh, uh, it's, it, it had a very strong styling, because it, it, uh, it had to, to stand out compared to the school brooms, like the one we've got above us here. So this was just a bog-standard... Bog-standard, uh, yeah. So the idea was with the bog-standard brooms was that they were almost like when you... Remember at school when you got your cricket bats out and everyone chose one, everyone had the last one, the, the ratty one with the bits missing. The rubbish was one kinda, didn't yes. really fly straight, it was yeah. a bit rubbish, yeah. you never kept, hit a six Never went off. left. And yeah. there was always one kid who had a really nice one. This is from the film we've been working on at the moment. Um, and uh, this has been built for Arthur Weasley. He loves his muggle design, it's great. So he's got, got proper bicycle pedals and bicycle <laughs> cranks, but this is a lovely bit of design. It's a great idea of the bike bag on the back. These are designed and built so that they can be put onto rigs in the green screen, and then they're thrown around the room, so they've got to be safe. So you actually have a broom here that's made of... It's got a titanium component, so that's all titanium it casting. It's like a shotgun as well. Exactly, it's, it's that butt of a gun. That's a titanium casting. Uh, titanium arms here because they have to you have to get it as light as you can but also it's incredibly strong how much would something like that be worth <laughs> well if you think that we probably had to, we had to make four of them so uh, and we probably spent on the castings for all of them probably 25,000 pounds on the castings alone so yes yeah it's, it's a lot of money but they ha you <laughs> you you can't dice with people's safety really. No, you can't. No. Or mad eye because unless you're going to spend the best, he's going to be furious. Uh, no, exactly. I, I I don't want a thick ear from him. Oh my goodness me! I didn't think it was going to be anywhere near that. So we're talking over a hundred thousand pounds just for the brooms that you've used for him for all the castings and everything and. Yeah, and all the work I'd say for all the moody brooms because there are multiples. Yeah, there's probably wow. around there. Now, titanium is used to build jet engines, missiles and spacecraft, as well as Harry Potter brooms. So it might be quite high up there, but at least I know I'm safe. So somehow I've got to get my leg over there. Yep. Go with your left leg. That's it. Oh, my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's better. You're right, it's not comfortable, is it? No, not at all. OK, is that better? Yep, nice and tight. I'm strapped in. Nigel, let's go live on the rig. That wasn't me. <laughs> Is it groaning under my weight? Is that, is that the issue? Wow! Over the years, the team have made around 100 brooms in at least 20 different designs. 
There have been different broomsticks for different characters. Technology has changed, and of course the children who flew them in the early films are now taller and heavier adults. Oh, I feel like I'm getting into this now. Oh, hello. Oh, getting a bit more excited. Oh, hello. Ooh. Dan's right. It isn't comfortable, but it is great fun. What I need now, though, is a bit of scenery. That's more like it. Right. I'm off home the quick way. I think a lot of it, quite a bit of it, is to do with this kind of object that we've got, the Horcrux locket. It's kind of, because we're all kind of wearing it in different stages, it's got to take turns in wearing it. And it kind of has this really weird effect on you. The wearer becomes kind of exhausted and starts to think like really negative thoughts and it kind of like starts to take over the, you know, whoever's wearing it. And the person that it affects the most is Ron. I think she's kind of paranoid and... and, and it's, 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 it was really cool doing those kind of scenes. You think I don't know how this feels? You don't know how it feels! Your parents are dead! You have no family! <laughs> he's really insecure about how close Hermione and, and Harry are because he's in love with Hermione and that's stressing him out and he, um, he's hungry, he's not been away from... You know, he's used to being taken care of <laughs> and, you know, they're alone and they don't know what they're doing. And, and James Killick. And Ron is constantly listening to the radio trying to find out, you know, to, for news of his family and hears the death toll of more and more people, muggles and wizards alike, who have been killed um, as a result of, 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 of the dark forces mm. that are increasing in power, drives them to the point where that tension eventually overflows. Stop! Stop! Finally, go! Go then! Now, this wasn't something that was in the book, but I think Joe will love it, uh, which is Ron leaves and they're both devastated, but particularly Hermione. She's decided to stay with Harry and she misses the, you know, she loves Ron too. Mm. And uh, just like he loves her, though they found it very difficult to express that. Me and Hermione just sort of start dancing to this song. And it's a slow, it's a slow song, together. And it's, it's a slow dance, basically, and even I can just about manage that. It is a very lovely and tender scene, and it's one of those moments between Harry and Hermione. In fact, it is the only moment between Harry and Hermione where you go, are they about to, to, to do something they might... No, no, OK, no, it's fine, they're not. If I may, I understand that you're dyspraxic. Yes, yes, mildly. Mildly. Yes. Just, can you explain sort of how that manifests itself and what the implication, therefore, is that in terms of stunts and so on? I mean, if anything, the stunts and stuff has actually helped a lot because it deals with coordination and, and that's the... The main thing that I say about dyspraxia is that it's to do with coordination. I mean, it's the, you know some people have it very, very badly and find it hard to you know catch a ball and handle like coordination stuff. I've never had it quite that badly, although you should see me throw. <laughs> um, but it's also a processing thing, so I take in information slightly slower um, than everybody else does. Through doing training and through doing bits of gymnastics when I was younger on on Potter, it, that has absolutely stood me in very good stead and has made all the dyspraxia stuff kind of decrease a, a lot. This training was put to good use during a terrifying chase through the forest, where Dan and Emma and Rupert surprised everyone. Oh, but don't miss out the chase. The but chase you get the is chase. awesome. So talk us through the chase. The chase is great before we get captured. Um, oh, so cool. So we went to this amazing forest and they had this camera set up that I've never seen before, which is that it kind of like runs on a wire. So it's like kind of like a remote control camera. It's kind of incredible. And um, it meant that it could go unbelievably fast. So usually when we do the running scenes, there's like a poor cameraman, like <laughs> desperately trying to like sweating, like, trying, <laughs> trying to keep up with us. And we're kind of like having to slow it down a little bit. But with this, this camera was so bloody fast. Dan and I and Rupert were killing ourselves. I mean, <laughs> killing ourselves. I've never run so hard in my entire life. In this scene, as the film builds to its climax, Harry, Ron and Hermione are literally running for their lives from Voldemort's bounty hunters, the Snatchers. We go to take one, I go, OK, action. And they go... <laughs> and I think, whoa! And they're really trying to... And they run like maniacs, and we've got quad bikes, and trying to keep up with them. And it's because they are trying to outcompete each other. Dan wants to run faster than Emma. Emma wants to run faster than Dan. And Rupert just wants to be anywhere to try and keep up with a pair of them. 
Trust, they never really tell us that we're going to do stuff like this. We arrive on set and they're like, right, we're going to, you know, go. And you're just like, hey, and you just start running, really. Yeah. <laughs> it's mad. There's a few obstacles as well we have to... Yeah, there's quite... Because they've had to... Um, they've taken lots of the tree stumps out, so there's sort of loads of stumps around this level, like perfect tripping over height. Their run has been carefully planned, tree stumps included, by stunt coordinator Greg Powell. We went down and looked at it first, and we like from A to B. And what we have to do is, uh, is prep the ground because then we then we let you know wrap the artist knees up and ankles up with bands to make sure they're tight and just let them go, and it was good. I imagine that some of the um, actors are keen to do as much as they possibly can, whereas others are a little bit sort of more nervous. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Dan, for instance, he go all day long. The one who surprised me on the day at, uh, uh, at Swindley was uh, was Emma. There was loads of pyrotechnics. I was like firing, shooting spells behind me, and like explosions were going off. Oh, wow. I mean, it was so much fun. It was fun. That's the sort of thing you dream about doing. Like, you watch the film and you think, if only I'd actually done it. But you actually I got actually to do got it. to do it. I felt pretty. I felt pretty great. And uh, I was really pleased because Greg, who's head of stunts, was kind of really like, oh, she's just a little girl. She's not really gonna. She's not really gonna do it. And I really gave it my all. I like, <laughs> really gave it my best. <laughs> When we was rehearsing this, I was looking at it, I said, no, just go a little bit slower, because I'm not sure whether they keep up with that. You just beat the lot of them. They're just going to make a third round. Good. Are you guys secretly competing? Who's going to get oh, those yeah. passes? That's really good, eh? <laughs> That's the you? <laughs> doing it along there. Really good. Well, thanks. He came up to me and he was like, oh, it's quite, you know, it's quite good. It's like, oh, <laughs> a huge compliment from Greg. <laughs> yeah, coming from Greg, I was, I was quite pleased. You know, he's, like, worked on some of the biggest action films of all time. The scene has rather a shocking end as Hermione appears to turn on Harry. <laughs> we are brought, actually, to Malfoy Manor by the Snatchers because they think they might have found Harry Potter. But they're not sure because Hermione has put this stinging jinx on me which makes this kind of half of my face swell up to about four times its natural size. What happened to you, ugly? <laughs> no, not you. But it's pretty much... His eye and everything else is a kind of weird... It's like it's melted or...? Yeah, it's really uncomfortable to look at, actually. Really? Yeah, it looks like it... Melted is the best, I haven't even thought of that word, but that's the one. It looks like it's sort of drooping off his face a bit. The audience has to believe that the Malfoys won't recognise him, so it has to be enough of a disguise that you buy into the fact he is disguised. However, you mustn't lose Dan. You know, it must be completely hidden because you want your audience to still feel empathetic mm. with the fact it's him. The worst part of it is putting it on in the morning, sure. which is like from six o'clock till nine o'clock in the morning, all you can sort of smell and feel is glue. I think he really loved it to begin with, because it was like being a different person. So when you first saw Dan in it, he kind of, he kind of sauntered around and Dan just loved not quite being Harry, being someone else. What's your name? Dudley. The piece itself moves very softly and with very little resistance so that all the muscle movements, you know, all the performance that's going on behind comes through. If you think of the prosthetic as a skin we're creating and you think of the actor's face as a piece of machinery underneath that moves in certain ways, we mustn't dilute that movement mm. because we're filtering the performance. That's not very sort of leading man-esque, is it, to disfigure you quite so dramatically? Work for John Hurt, Death for Man. <laughs> Touch Your boyfriend will get much get worse than that if he doesn't learn to behave himself. So that's where we're going to have to leave it. But, to be honest, with the body count rising like it is, we probably all need a bit of a breather. I guess this is the middle of the end. I can't tell you any more about the film, but I can tell you there is a cracking cliffhanger. So enjoy it, and I'll see you next summer for the final chapter. <laughs>